of our children today who would like to keep Hegwig company for me today, could you please come forward, all of you who would like to keep Hegwig company, please. Have a seat right there, there, yeah. <laughs> Keep me company too. A few years ago, my family and I visited, visited the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Orlando, Florida, and it felt surreal being there. It was like crossing the threshold between the invisible world and the visible world. The threshold between the world of the imagination and the real world. My son and I had been deeply immersed in the imaginary world of Harry Potter for over a decade, but experiencing that world with all the senses was something completely different. I mean, strolling along Diagon Alley. I mean, that moment of entering Hogwarts Castle. I mean, to actually taste butter beer. <laughs> it was strange and wonderful and surreal and magical, and it made me realize how ideas, something ethereal that we can grasp, can actually become real. And so the experience may be questioned what is real and what isn't. There is a passage in the last book of the series, The Deathly Hallows, that speaks of this. It's a part when Harry dies, I mean, quote unquote, dies. <laughs> Don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> and he meets Dumbledore, and Harry asks him if the conversation they are having is real or whether it's happening inside his head. And Dumbledore tells Harry, of course it's happening in your head, Harry, but why on earth should that mean that it is not real? As a minister in training, I am interested in the sources of inspiration we find in the imaginary world that can lead to deeper meaning, to connection, to spiritual wellness. And I'm also interested in how creativity and the imagination can be used as tools for transforming the world. Many of you know that because I grew up in Cuba, at a time when religion was forbidden, I didn't have access to scripture or any official religious training. Therefore, the only source I could draw from was my direct experience with the transcendent mystery. Some of you have heard the story of me finding the sacred in the life force of a hurricane when I was four years old. Later, I was inspired and fascinated by the dandelions that grow through a crack on the sidewalk. I was fascinated by the life force that made them grow, that resilience life force, that almost stubborn life force. I mean, what are the chances of that dandelion growing like that from down there with such little soil, such little light, and so much cement oppressing it? I have always been interested in that impulse towards growth that living things have. My observations of the natural world made me realize that the same life force that runs through me runs through you and runs through every living thing. Other cultures and religions have called this life force by many names, prana, mana, chi, ruach. In Cuba, that energy is known as la chispa. Let me show you what chispa is. La chispa. People with chispa 
have a certain aliveness about them, a vitality. They have a sparkle in their eyes. And part of my call to ministry is the exploration of what contributes to the strength of our shispa, to the flourishing of the life force inside ourselves, and what drains it. I mean, the things that give us life and the things that deaden us. In Harry Potter terms, I am interested in exploring our sacred spark, our magic, as well as the dementors in our lives that suck the life force out of us. There are, pa there are particular dementors that affect some of us more than others. For me, the mentors are attached to numbers and math and <laughs> spreadsheets. <laughs> they suck the life force out of me. They make my blood run cold. Then there are more serious dementors in the form of social injustices such as racism, sexism, transphobia, xenophobia, that, that affects some of us more than others. Belief systems can also play a role, the role of the mentors in our lives. For example, some theologies can be damaging to our human sense of worth and dignity, which diminishes our essence. Another dementor that affects almost most of us is perfectionism, right? Perfectionism. So, so I have been thinking, how can we protect ourselves and our shispa from the dementors of our lives. If we were in Hogwarts, we would take a class called, anybody remember? What is that? Defense Against the Dark Arts. And you are a Gryffindor? 10 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> and then they would teach us one particular um, charm to protect us from the dementors. Anybody knows what that is? Patronus. It's the Patronus charm. Wash your house. Okay, another 10. Yeah. What's that? Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw? Yeah. Very good. 10 points for Ravenclaw. <laughs> the Patronus charm is a defense spell which produces a silver light. And I'm a big proponent of creating our own strategies to protect our sacred spark. For example, my personal patronus against the dementor, that is perfectionism, is a psychological construct that has become part of my identity. Because perfectionism has been one of the worst, most vicious things I've ever had to battle inside myself, I came up with a term years ago to fight it. I now call myself an imperfectionist <laughs> and a proud one. And so when perfectionism tries to get in the way, I'm like, no, 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 no. Remember, I am an imperfectionist. I don't do perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> in general, as a practice of liberation, now, every time I find a dementor lurking around, every time I feel my blood run cold, I conjure up a strategy to deal with it. And I highly recommend the approach. I have also found that having a strong spiritual practice is one of the best patronos we can conjure up to protect ourselves from the dementors. Now, protecting our life force is one thing and cultivating it is another. Growing up, in addition to seeing the life force outside of myself in hurricanes and dandelions, I would also find it inside myself, often as a rush of creativity. An idea would come and it would light me up from within. This is when my shispa was at its best. It could light up a whole football stadium. It took me years to find the right word for that feeling of being lit up from within. In English, that word is ebullience, a cheerful enthusiasm. And you know the root of the word enthusiasm, right? It comes from the Greek entheos, which means God with or filled with God. So to be enthusiastic is to be filled with God. 
Again, because growing up, I didn't go to church. This experience of being filled with God was one of the closest things to the sacred I could find. So I began to associate God with creativity. Now, when I'm talking about creativity, I'm not talking about creating art. We are all constantly creating. Some of us are really good at creating magic with numbers in spreadsheets. (laughs) Not me, but some. Some of us create healing spaces. Some of us create new paths for others. Some of us create change. So it turns out that my theology, theological understanding of God as creativity was not that strange. Decades later in seminary, I found that many of the theologians I was studying also view God as a creative force as the, or as the creativity of the cosmos. The theologian Mark C. Taylor puts it this way, the divine is not elsewhere, but in the emergent creativity that figures, disfigures, and refigures the infinite fabric of life. This life force that creates through us has been called by many names, muse, holy spirit, daemon, genius. In some Spanish countries, we call that creative function el duende. El duende is something like Dobby (laughs) in Harry Potter. It's an elf that helps us. And just like Dobby, our duende can be very shy. It needs a safe environment free of criticism and perfectionism in order to show itself and create through us. The writer Clarissa Pincola Estes puts it this way in this long but worthy fragment from her book, Creative Fire. And I quote, in the center of the psyche, there is a mystical substance that in Spanish we call el duende, the creative function. It is the awe of life. It is the animating engine, the creative mind. And it's more than animation. It is a way of living that is following all the shapes and curves of the lay of the land of your psyche. El duende is behind the instinctual nature, is the breath of life, the oxygenating system that supports creative life. This unseen force can fill people with God. It is the center of the psyche. It cannot be extracted or taken out like a loaf of bread. Nor can it be put in as one puts food in one's mouth. It is a being. It comes to roost or to visit those who make a place for it. And some of us are born with the gift of it, and some of us must chase it everywhere. Yet if you attempt to tie it down, it will wither. And if you set a trap for it, it will evade you. And if you use it without replenish it, it will retreat. And if you think it costs nothing to have, all your hair will be burned off. (laughs) The end of that quote. Also like Dobby, el duente can be a troublemaker. He gets bored when we get too comfortable. He wants novelty, he wants excitement, he wants magic. Our duende is also quite unique, as each of us are. There are no two duendes alike. The dancer Martha Graham spoke about this. She said, there is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And since there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and will be lost. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and it will be lost. What a tragedy. The Gospel of Thomas also speaks of this life force that is translated through us into action and he warns us against blocking it. He reads, if you bring forth what is... Okay. 
It's, it's a force. That's el duende working here. <laughs> it's a troublemaker, I told you. <laughs> if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. That is from the Gospel of Thomas. I often say that what is not expressed is depressed. And a genius trapped inside a person can create havoc. In fact, J.K. Rowling, the author of the series, actually started writing the first manuscript as a way to cope with what she called her inner dementors. Rowling had been diagnosed with clinical depression and writing the story of the young wizard and his friend was a way for her to cope with it. In some ways, liberating her genius saved her. That was 25 years ago. She was then a struggling single mother who rode in cafes in the short periods while her infant child slept next to her. In 1995, she finished the first manuscript of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which was typed in an old manual typewriter. The manuscript was submitted to 12 publishing houses, and all of them rejected it. A year later, she was told that the book would finally be published after Alice Newton, the eight-year-old daughter of a publisher's chairman, read the first chapter and demanded the next. <laughs> Yet only 500 copies of that first book were printed. Now the books have sold 500 million copies worldwide, making it the best-selling book series in history. And those original 500 copies now are worth around $15,000 each. Rowling's unique genius as it has inspired an entire generation. Now, you know that I love to uplift the genius of others in my sermons. So in the spirit of that, let me share some wisdom I heard this week from my colleagues here. The Reverend Prose has been talking about the ministry of the bright arts instead of the ministry of the dark arts. And, and I think it's so perfect. Ministry of the bright arts. I love it. Then my teacher, Reverend Lavenhard, said something that had stayed with me, something he heard from his teachers. He said that his modern interpretation of Unitarian Universalism is that Unitarian means one source and Universalism means one destiny. My own personal interpretation of that is that we all come from one sacred life force, the same I've been talking about throughout today, which runs through every living thing. And one destiny for me means the growth and evolution of that life force within us. As living organisms, our natural instinct is to grow, to evolve. And as a UU minister in training, I encourage all of us to dismantle the systems inside of ourselves and outside that keep us from our destiny to grow and evolve and flourish. Also, a few days ago, my sister colleague, the newly ordained Reverend Halu, who is recovering after her ordination today, <laughs> since her ministry is also about liberation, she sent me this quote from Shani Nicholas that I felt was perfect for this sermon. Here it is. It reads, I break all spells that keep me asleep from my own magic. And I love that. And let me get my wand to do some magic here. Okay. Now, with the power vested in me as your minister of the bright arts, I declare that I break all spells that keep you asleep from your own magic. Because perhaps that's what Harry Potter is all about. Waking up from the slumber of the Mughal world, the world of consumerism and conformity. Perhaps it's a call to find our inner world of magic, the world of creativity and the imagination. 
Perhaps it's a call to enthusiasm, to be filled with God and allowing that sacred spark to create through us. Perhaps it's a call for all of us to come together against the evils of the world that keep us from living our magic. So what's your magic? What lights you up from within? What needs to break free? Now, if Harry Potter and magic and creativity are not your cup of tea, that is okay. What we're talking about here is growth and potential. What I'm promoting is more aliveness and more expansion in our soul. It is what Gay Hendrick calls living in our zone of genius, doing what energizes us, not what sucks the life out of us. Another metaphor for this is a seed. So here is a story of some magical seeds. In the 1700s, some mimosa seeds were brought from China to the Natural Museum in London. Then during the bombing of the city during World War II, the damage to the museum allowed rain and sunlight to enter the building. And these seeds, which had been in a case for over 150 years, cracked open and started to sprout. The conditions were finally right for them to hear the call to grow and follow the natural instinct towards flourishing. There is a picture on the screen of the gorgeous mimosa trees and flowers. We have them here in Tulsa. I saw them when I got here this summer. But here's the thing. We all have dormant seeds inside ourselves waiting to hear the call to crack open and obviously, it's never too late. This reminds me of something the poet Rumi once wrote, and I quote, what was said to the rose that made it open was said to me here in my chest. What was said to the rose that made it open was said to me here in my chest. May your rose open. May your seeds sprout. May you find your magic. May it be so. Today. We love connecting with people all across the country and around the world sharing our powerful message of love beyond belief. There's something new happening here. You can now join All Souls as a virtual member. Our virtual membership is designed for friends who live outside of Tulsa, Oklahoma and who want to engage with All Souls in a meaningful way. You can be part of an expanding family, a global family really, wherever you are. If you live in Oklahoma, Ohio, or Orange County, California, Canada, or Cameroon. 
By becoming a virtual member, you'll be able to deepen your connections with members and friends here in Tulsa and with members wherever you are. Each week, you'll receive special All Souls content tailored for you, our virtual members. Virtual members have access to pastoral care, to personal prayers, and also receive invitations to exclusive web events. You can learn more, and if you're ready, you can become a virtual member today by visiting allsoulschurch.org forward slash virtual membership. We're grateful our ministries are having a positive impact on your life, and we want to share the good news of Love Beyond Belief with more and more people. So no matter what, we need your support to keep this ministry growing and thriving. So please consider making a gift today. You can do so by texting Love BB for Love Beyond Belief to 73256 or simply visit our website. You are a blessing in our lives. May you be blessed. And be a blessing.